the world of first century Rome, slaves have no legal standing. Fathers arranged all marriage, and women were always under the authority of another man, whether it's their father or their husband. And so if you read one verse without context, wives, be subject to your husbands, you can take that one verse and do quite a bit with it. You could use it and abuse it to condone behavior that is antithetical to the gospel. Context is everything. If you read one snippet out of the Bible, I can take the Bible and use it to prove just about anything if I can just use one verse, right? Look at it in context, and then you start understanding it well. And context is everything. And so let's look at this in context. It begins by reading the entire verse. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It's not just wise to be subject, it is as fitting in the Lord. What does that mean? Evidently, there's a sense of a woman being subject, subject not just because, but because it is how we line up with our life, with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the chapter before, in uh, verses before, in 3.12, Colossians 3.12, we read what it means to be in the Lord. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Bear with one another. If another has a complaint against you, forgive them as the Lord forgave you. Clothe yourself with love and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And so when it says, wives be subject in the manner of Jesus, that's what it's describing. Wives embody this practice of being holy and, and being compassionate and kind and humble and meek and patient. And, right, you can never forget the, forget the small verbs in Scripture, right? Wives be subject in the manner of Jesus and husbands love their wives and never treat them harshly. There is no other contemporaneous document that we can find in the first century. There is no letter, speech, there is nothing we can find from this time period that combines wives being subject to husbands with a reciprocity, with a reciprocity to husbands. To say that husbands would have such a duty to their wives would have been a shocking statement to make. And so what Paul says is, Paul says the word love, love your wife. Now, the word love, we use one word for love, and, and I can say that I love my tractor and I love my wife, and I better mean two different things by that one word. They have multiple words in Greek. You can have love, uh, philia, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. You love things because you just kind of enjoy them. That's not the word Paul uses. There's the love of attraction, eros. That's not the word Paul uses. He uses agape, the love of another because it is good to do so. A committed love that chooses the best for other people. The tightness is the word of love that drives God to send his only begotten son, who then empties himself, taking the form of a servant, being humble and obedient. So, to say love your wife, if you use the word agape, and be talking in a Christian context, to love like Jesus loves in the Lord, this is a tall ask. This is an impressive thing. Love her to the point of being willing to die for her, always seeking what is best for her. And then Paul gives me the detail, right? Love your wives and never treat them harshly. <coughs> this is like what when, you, when you're going away for a while and you warn your kids, don't go rooting around in the kitchen, especially don't touch the Oreos. I know how many are in the bag. But you don't say don't touch the Oreos because they, they might get into it. You say don't touch the Oreos because you know that's what they want to do most. That's what they're likely to do. Right? If you warn someone not to do something, if that is what has happened in the past. This is a little bit more serious, right? Paul is saying, love your wives and do not treat them harshly, because they have treated them harshly. Right? This is quite the warning. Paul is telling the husbands, back off, do not see your wives as properly, but humbly serve them as you are in the Lord. The profession of Jesus Christ changes everything, and it starts with marriage, husbands and wives, how they are mutually submissive to each other. Paul then moves on. 
tells the children, Paul then tells the children, obey your parents. Duh. Right? This is not a hard ask, right? Obey your parents. Uh, it's except this is a, and then he moves on and says in verse 21, do not, fathers, do not provoke your children. Now, husbands and wives having mutual responsibilities is just as surprising as this. To say that children have any rights, that you can't, like, Paul has now talked about how husbands should treat their wives, and now he's telling parents how to be parents to their children. Is there any quicker way to hack someone off and to critique how they're parenting their kids? Like, can you think of a quicker way to get into an argument than to say, I don't think you should be treating your kids like that? That's what Paul's doing here, right? He's saying, fathers, no plus he's not dogging on the moms, fathers, do not be harsh to your children, else they would lose hearts, right? This is a point in detail. Like, no more people does not do what you expect them to do. And, and you start to see this pattern here. The pattern is that Paul is saying, we, we, because of who you are in the Lord, uh, there, when it comes to personal relationships, those need to be transformed. And, and so he'll start with one side of the relationship, wives, children, the side that has the least power. And he'll say, now you need to do certain things because you are in Jesus. And then he goes to the second half of the relationship, husbands and fathers, the person who has far greater authority, and he says, and you have the greater burden. And the person who has the greater authority here, the greater power, has the greater burden. You know how Paul is laying this out, because you are following Jesus, and Jesus is the most powerful one, and he forsook all power taking on the form of the servant. So the greater power you have, the more humility you need to have in using it. Or as is captured in that great source of wisdom, Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. All right, that is inspired by that, I'm sure. So you won't be surprised by these next few verses. We have another relationship here between slaves and masters. And slaves goes first, the slaves go first because they have the least power. Slaves obey their earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched in order to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever your task is, put yourselves into it, as done for the Lord and not for your masters. Since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong has been has been done, and there is no partiality, masters. Treat your slaves justly and fairly, for you know that you also have a master in heaven. This is quite the ask. Slaves, obey your masters. Well, it's not like they had any other choice. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, for you also have a master. This relationship, Paul takes the most time to explain this one because it is obviously the most fraught. Uh, this is the one that's complicated, very complicated. If Paul had, when Paul, he, he writes a letter called Philemon, and you can go read it, it's one chapter long. Uh, in the letter to Philemon, Paul writes about a slave, Onesimus, and he basically leans on Philemon to say, you need to free your slave, Onesimus. Right, you, you need to. Because if you owe me anything, you owe me this. Let Odysseus free. Right? That, that's what Paul does. But Paul does that when he's talking to one person that he knows well. In this situation, Paul is writing to an entire church, and he's writing to all of them, and he needs all of them to listen. And you can only go so far so fast if you go too fast. If Paul had said, everyone, you need to free your slaves, at that point, I think they would have just shut down and torn up the letter and walked away, right? You could only push so fast. And so he's making this point. Masters, don't forget that you have a master who is watching. And when you come to this table, you are both equals at this table. Now it's worth stepping back and seeing how this fits into this entire letter. In fact, Paul has been laying out an argument in the letter to the Church of Colossae. And we started with this at the beginning, grace to you and peace. He says that at the beginning of the letter, so that everyone was like, chill. Everyone relax. I know we're fighting intense disgrace, peace. Everyone just take some deep breaths. 
Right? And then he starts talking about how we receive what God is doing. We're not the ones who are acting out our salvation. We're receiving what God is doing. And so don't you dare add anything to Jesus. Like when we offer Jesus, we offer Jesus so that that's what we offer. We don't make any, you don't have to do anything else other than accept Jesus. And that as we accept Jesus, as we, we gather together and worship and we look up to Jesus, we are receiving all that Jesus is pouring out. And that is what transforms us. It is not that we earn it or deserve it or work it, it's that we receive what God offers. And then this is the final piece. So what's that look like? If you are receiving the grace of God on a regular basis, and you are receiving all that God is doing, how does that change you? Well, it changes wives and husbands, it changes children and fathers, it changes slaves and masters. This is Paul explaining what changes as we follow Jesus. And he's laying out something rather uh, striking. I was trying to figure out how to capture this, and if you look at the front of your bulletin, you'll see, I was trying to get this on the front, uh, on the left, it lays out how people saw the world at that point. God was all-powerful, and then under God were the men, the husbands, the fathers. They were the next most powerful, and they had authority over wives, and they had authority, then they were children and slaves, and that was like the order of power and authority in the first century. Men, God, men, women, children, slaves. And what Paul is laying out is what you see on the right side, that they're all equal before God. Right? And so this is how he is starting to lay out. What changes when you start following Jesus? When you come to this table, you are all equal at this table. Husbands, wives, children, fathers, masters, slaves. At this table, you are all the same, children of God. And that is what uh, Paul is making this, this argument is not just the one letter that Paul is arguing this. In all of his letters, Paul says again and again, in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew, uh, slave nor free, Jew nor free. Right? He's talking about this, this is how Jesus is going, Jesus is commanded to go out and baptize everyone, teaching them to do what I say. This is how you transform the world. You transform the world one family at a time as it comes to this table, as we receive what God is offering. Now, it can be hard to see what a difference this has made. Because in, the, in retrospect, it looks obvious. But at the time when Paul writes this, the only people who had rights, like legal rights, were men who were born in the Italian peninsula, because they were in the Roman Empire, and if you weren't a man born in the Italian peninsula or had a lot of money uh, to buy Italian, uh, Roman citizenship, you had no rights. And so Paul is saying that women should have rights. And we say, of course. And at the time, they would say, that's crazy. Right? Paul writes this and is talking about how children have rights. Of course children should have rights. Like we have it in DFX. Like we have things that we, we, we institutionalize that we care about children. We have schools and we have programs. In Paul's time, he was only a few decades removed from Sparta. Y'all ever heard of Sparta, the Greek city-state? Like what is Sparta known for? They fought really well. How did they get such amazing soldiers? I'll tell you. Part of it was, if you had a child in Sparta, you would take this child to the a gathering called the Marusia, and the Marusia would analyze this child and determine whether it was healthy enough to live. And if it was not determined to be healthy enough to live, it, they just left out the eldest to die. It was like early eugenics. If you didn't have a perfectly formed, healthy child, your child would be killed because that's what you did with unhealthy children. And so for Paul to say, don't be too hard on your kids when Sparta is just around the corner, like, Paul is laying down a transformative approach to how the family works, and we lose track of that because we're, we're down the road, and Paul's opinions have swayed and changed uh, how life goes now. <clears throat> and, and so, guided by the wisdom of Paul, like, here's what we've got. We said, Paul has started with grace and peace to you, 
accepts Jesus, as we receive him, we are changed by him doing so. And, and here is how you start using this logic. You start using the, the logic of looking at relationships and seeing how they might be transformed by both people following Jesus. And, and that is the logic that he hopes the church learns to use. It's the logic I hope we continue to learn to use today. The challenge is, if I'm going to say something like, this is what I think we should do, it's always going to be a challenge what we might do next. And what, as we look back, it will always make sense in retrospect. Like, there was a point in time in the Middle Ages when Christians invented the hospital because they didn't think people should have to die alone. And of course no one should die alone. Well, why do we believe that today? Because Christians first dare to think it. Because in Christ, the sick and the well should have that relationship. Sick, you should wait upon what Jesus will do. Those who are well, why don't you go take care of them? Right? That's the logic that developed. And, and so I'm going to risk something. I will try to use some Pauline logic. Now, I'll try to use this today. But I need to make clear that I'm not Jesus and I'm not Paul. So I, did I ever, have I told you that I reserve the right to be wrong? I might be about to exercise that. So here goes. Well, let's see if I manage to put my foot in my mouth or not. Tomorrow's Labor Day, so let me give you some statistics. The value of the minimum wage peaked in 1968. Since then, the minimum wage has been declining in value, uh, adjusted for inflation. And if the minimum wage had kept up with inflation, it would be at $11.62 an hour. As you may have noticed, prices have gone up. How much does gas cost now compared to how much it cost when you started driving? For me, it's tripled because it cost a buck a gallon when I started driving. This is according to uh, the December 22nd uh, Business Insider from 2017. Right? So if the minimum wage had kept up with inflation, it would be almost $12 right now, it is $7.25. I was talking to a friend of mine who has a story that you might be familiar with. His grandpa got out of high school, got a local, uh, got a job at a local mill and a uh, local factory, got married, had kids, bought a car, bought a house, wife stayed home to raise the kids, all based on a high school degree. That doesn't happen anymore, does it? Over the years, most of the people that have walked in my door looking for need, for help and for assistance have been hardworking people where both hardworking families where both parents work. There are always exceptions. I can tell you about them later. But in general, people are working hard. Now, I have not heard a single politician of any stripe say that wages are where they need to be. Has anyone else, just making sure, covering the basis, has anyone heard a stump speech in the last decade that said that the American economy is serving high school graduates well, that everyone's making the money they need to make? Okay. If you are from a Republican or Democratic, conservative or liberal background, you will have different responses about how to handle this, but that's not my task. I'm like Paul. I'm not talking about trying to figure out how to respond to wage stagnation in all of America. I'm talking to y'all about how we live our lives. How does being in the Lord shape our lives as employees and employers? I believe that those categories apply to most of us. You have either been employed or have employed others. And so let me try this. This might be an example of Pauline logic. We'll start with employees first because they, I believe, tend to have less authority or power. Here's what Paul might say. Employees, do your job well. Not only when your boss is watching, but every time as if you were working for the Lord. Employers, treat your employees justly. Seeking their good as fervently as their own, remembering that they are also made in the image of God and loved by Jesus just as much as you are. Right. I think that what was maybe something Paul might say today to look at relationships and how our relationships and how we live our lives, either as employees or employers, are transformed by being followers of Jesus Christ. I think that is the type of reasoning that Paul is teaching the church, building this way of thinking for the entirety of the letter. 
Right? So they can get to this point and say to them, this is how you think as Christians. You look at your relationships, understanding that everyone always has a responsibility to each other, and those who have greater power have a greater, a greater responsibility. Rooted in an experience of how Christ has changed his life, Paul is firmly convinced that God's power can and will transform all of creation. And that it begins and continues in each of our homes. You want to change the world, you look in the mirror, and you change how we live. How does, how does accepting the grace that Jesus offers overflow out of our lives into the lives of those 